any man is part of this cycle of life, forming a passive part. You see, the great prophecies of the Bible bring present-day events into focus. Welcome to South Pacific Classics. Hello, I'm Alan Lindsay. We've been trawling through our archives for film footage produced by the Adventist Church in years gone by. The film we're about to see highlights the missionary efforts of the church in the South Pacific. It's a 1962 production which focuses on the work of pioneer medical missionary Leonard Barnard, who spent over 20 years in Papua New Guinea. And a warning, some of the language used in this film to describe the people and customs of Papua New Guinea would be considered inappropriate by today's standards. And there are some graphic images of medical procedures and nudity in a traditional village setting. Prepare to be challenged and inspired as South Pacific Classics presents The Cry of New Guinea. Lying in the coral seas just north of Australia, New Guinea, with an area of more than 300,000 square miles, is the world's largest tropical island. Its vast interior is a rugged mass of wildly beautiful mountain ranges, rising tier upon tier to the very heart of the island. New Guinea is a land flowing with water, cascading from the heights carving out canyons on its way to the sea. Sunshine, rain, and the rich volcanic soil have produced clinging vines and giant trees. The land is clothed in luxuriant tropical verdure, and exotic flowers decorate the forest roof. Strange creatures live in the seclusion of the jungle wilderness. Creatures ever hunting and ever hunted in the fierce law of the survival of the fittest. Tall kunai grass and heavy bush fills the great valleys and many picturesque villages cling to the ridges. But here, all semblance to paradise ends. For the primitive people who for countless generations have inhabited these mountain places live by the jungle law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The bow and arrow is their constant companion for every neighboring village is a potential enemy. These people are some of the most primitive in the world. They are shackled by fear, ignorance, and superstition, and the women are degraded almost to the level of animals. At an altitude of 5,000 feet, the town of Goroka has recently sprung up, center of government, and headquarters of the Eastern Highlands Mission of Seventh-day Adventists. Here at his clinic, medical missionary Leonard Barnard is preparing supplies for a six-week trek to the primitive tribes back in the mountains. Missionary Barnard is one of more than a hundred Adventist missionaries working for the underprivileged peoples of the New Guinea area. Supplies are being loaded into the Land Rover which will be used for the first part of the journey, one day's run back into the hills. The rough highland road runs through Kunai grass country to the foothills of mighty Mount Michael, a 12,000 foot peak dominating the area. Swaying swing bridges are just one of the hazards of the journey, which will pass through the tribal lands of many language groups. Slowly, roads are being pushed into this remote region, aiding the missionary in his work. But eventually, the road ends, and all supplies must be resorted and made into suitable packs for native porters. This village has had previous contact with the missionary, and plenty of volunteers are available. Forty carriers are hired, and next morning, the expedition sets out on the big walkabout which will take them nearly 300 miles into wild and practically unexplored country. The first part of the journey takes them into the great valley of the Tua River, 
Beyond are the misty mountains which must be crossed before the party reaches its final destination and visits its last needy village. Countless rushing rivers fed by tropical rains have cut deep gorges across the country and the ups and downs of the trail seem interminable as the patrol pushes into the jungle-covered hills. These mountain trails have been worn by centuries of barefoot native travel between villages. In times of intertribal fighting, the paths swarm with bow and arrow carrying savages, bent on wreaking vengeance on their enemies. The missionary, however, brings tidings of peace and messages of goodwill to all men. The stockaded villages, built of bush poles, bamboo, and kunai grass thatch, are set on narrow ridges for ease of defense. Here the missionary finds his first emergency case. A woman has been hit on the head with an axe. The axe-wielding husband holds baby as mother's scalp is stitched. These are hardy people and the sterilized wound will heal quickly. Interested onlookers see their first example of emergency surgery. These natives respond readily to kindness and medical work such as this is a good opening wedge to the hearts of the people. Lasting friendships are made, especially among the powerful chiefs and village leaders who strongly influence the people. In the friendly atmosphere thus created, the missionary brings out his picture roll and points the people to Jesus, the creator of all things around them, the friend and healer of all mankind. Now traveling at 6,000 feet altitude through the magnificent rainforests, the expedition descends into yet another valley. Several ascents and descents are made each day thus making this a slow and torturous way to travel. The carriers, whose food along the trail is native vegetables, never complain. They are hardy and used to these mountain trails, but the missionary envisions the day when a government airstrip will be built and weeks of walking will be reduced to a few hours flying. Another village is found, set among the Blue Hills, and there is more medical work to be done. Assisted by a native medical orderly, the missionary has lined up the whole village for general anti-yaws injections. Yaws is a terribly disfiguring disease which can spread quickly in tropical lands, but a single injection of penicillin will clear it from the bloodstream. Systematic treatment of the whole population, not missing the youngest children, will eradicate the disease from the district. There are many tropical skin diseases to be treated. Most of these respond to modern medicines. Malaria is one of the biggest killers among these people who have no method of combating it. Quinine is given here to fever-ridden villagers who use sections of bamboo as water bottles. This woman is not sick. She is wearing special beads in mourning of her husband who has recently died. Once more, the opportunity is taken to bring out the picture roll. These people have never been visited by a missionary before, and hearing the gospel story for the first time creates a longing for a way of life better than their headhunting and happier than their hatred and distrust of each other. They have no word for love in their language, but the missionary's message sets them thinking. The only form of worship among these people is connected with evil spirits of which they live in constant fear. The expedition is now two weeks underway and an early morning start is made to cross a great canyon and reach an entirely new tribe. It is estimated that some two million primitive people live in the wild New Guinea mountains. Most of these are illiterate. Some, in fact, have yet to see their first white man. 
deep in the valley, there is yet another river to cross. Good native style bridges are a rarity in this area and the party found that this was their last man-made bridge. Even when bridges are built, flash floods can wash them away overnight. From now on, the going becomes tough. The trails are ill-defined, almost non-existent, and the jungle is thicker. Treacherous, leech-infested swamps are encountered, sometimes taking hours to cross. This is inhospitable country that takes the exuberance out of the carriers and slows up travel to a few miles per day. Because of proven reports of cannibalism in this area, some of the carriers become frightened and wish to turn back. But the company pushes on and now enters the weird Pandanus jungle, domain of the semi-nomadic Karimui savages. There has been heavy rain back in the mountains, and if this river ever had a bridge, it has been washed away. Investigation showed that the strong current was neck deep in places, so a thick jungle vine was used as a safety line while the cargo boys inched their way across. The people of the Karimui Plateau, known as tree dwellers by other tribes, build large two-story community houses in jungle clearings. Tied together with native cordage, this great house is the home of an entire village of up to a hundred people. The men live on the top floor while the women use the lower. Hygiene and sanitation are non-existent. The Karimuis are among the most primitive and degraded people in the world. They are practicing cannibals and their medical needs are great. As a start, they are lined up for their anti-yaws injections. The warriors are never without their bows and arrows. They have utter distrust of even the neighboring village. The Karimui women drape themselves in hand-beaten bark cloth capes. They seemed utterly dejected and were as shy as jungle animals. Hideous tropical ulcers attack these people, frequently on the leg or ankle, making them hopeless cripples. Some of these ulcers proved to be very stubborn, and an ulcer case should have hospitalization. But there is no hospital in this area. However, help can be given right on the spot. This is missionary work of the first order. Here, a cannibal woman wears the smoke-dried foot of her late husband on her neck as a grisly charm. This is but one of their weird customs. After a tribesman dies, a long cannibalistic ritual is performed. The dismembered bones are then placed on a burial platform to bleach in the sun. In a strange form of ancestor worship, the dried bones are later collected into a fiber bag and hung in the dwelling house. It may be a coincidence, but it was found that leprosy was particularly prevalent among the cannibal people. These lighter colored patches of skin are the first signs of the dreaded leprosy. Now as the expedition penetrates into more remote and virtually unexplored regions, the trail becomes increasingly difficult. Trees are felled to form crude bridges over fast flowing streams. Because of the urgency of the need, the missionary cannot wait for roads and airstrips and modern transport. Missionary Barnard felt that his party was continually blessed with divine protection as they carried the gospel commission to the remotest corner of this needy section of the Lord's vineyard. When the people heard that a medical missionary was in their district, they carried this stretcher case many miles over difficult terrain to the field clinic. Examination shows that this man has pneumonia, jaundice, and other complications. He, too, 
needs hospitalization, but there is no hospital. Village chiefs make urgent pleas for help. They point to the disease and want in every hand. Because of ignorance, even small wounds become infected. One chief asked, why are my people dying? When can we have a teacher in our district? When can we have a hospital? A modern, well-equipped missionary hospital must be established soon. Land has been made available, a site with a view over the valley of a thousand villages. The people wait for the help that you can give. Thousands are waiting. For instance, there's the village dandy, a potential victim of lung disease. The lifelong addict to the disgusting betel nut habit. The village patriarch, crippled with rheumatism. The small boy who has just been told that he is a leper. The hardened headhunter, he needs spiritual help. And there's the uneducated mother with but a 50% chance of rearing her child. In fact, the whole village living in degradation and filth represents thousands of villages which you can help by giving liberally to the worldwide cause of missions. Because of a lack of funds, inadequately equipped native-style huts such as these must serve as medical clinics in some areas. Well-equipped hospitals and schools would give these underprivileged people their only real chance in life, thus showing them the true meaning of Christianity. The filming of the Cry of New Guinea involved a 40-day trek in the harsh terrain of the Highlands region. Filmmaker Eric Weir later said he wondered if he would make it out alive. The first Adventist mission plane landed in Papua New Guinea within a few years of the shooting of the film. To this day, Adventist aviation continues to provide essential services to church workers and the people of Papua New Guinea. We hope you're enjoying the show. South Pacific Classics will be back after the break. Welcome back to South Pacific Classics. In this show, we're highlighting the pioneering mission work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church amongst the people of Papua New Guinea. What we're going to see now is another short film by Eric Weir, this time focusing on the Sepik River region. The film was produced in the years following Papua New Guinea's independence in 1975. In comparing the two films, it's interesting to note the change in the style and the tone of the commentary, and the changes in the country in the intervening period. We hope you enjoy The River People. The people of the Sepik are schooled in the wisdom of the wild. They're in tune with their environment and have adjusted their lives to the changing moods of the great river and the ebb and flow of its quiet backwaters. Born in the rain-drenched mountains of the hinterland, the 700-mile Sepik River is the Amazon of New Guinea, an implacable, silt-laden tide. Its murmuring waters rise in season to flood the land and fill the still-water lagoons. The fringing forest supplies logs for dugout canoes, and the mighty river becomes a highway of travel for the people of the Sepik. Villages are never far from the river, and are built of jungle materials that cost no more than the physical effort of collection and construction. In this unhurried, rent-free society, there is a limited cash flow. But the sale of crocodile skins and tribal artifacts supplies money for luxuries, such as steel tools and clothing. Here, as in other Papua New Guinea tribal areas, the pig is the coveted symbol of wealth. Experts in the art of jungle survival 
women make saksak, a starchy food obtained from the trunk of the sago palm. Saksak pancakes are cooked on an open hot plate and provide at best a rubbery meal. And the river, with its deeps and shallows, is a constant source of fish, the people's main protein item. So, life on the river is a constant round of food gathering and food preparation. Much time is spent in canoe travel from villages to distant gardens, or to sago stands in the jungle. It's left to the women folk to attend to most of the daily chores, such as gathering firewood and weaving ingenious fish traps from jungle cane. The men attend to other tribal affairs, including the preparation of spirit worship symbols in a highly stylized art form. Dancing in devil mask and costume is part of a complicated system of tribal ceremonial life, which is strictly in the male domain. But this is not a carefree paradise. Because of lack of hygiene and the mosquito-infested environment, the river people have suffered severely from health problems. Diseases such as malaria, dysentery and malnutrition have taken their toll, especially among young children. The infant mortality rate has averaged as high as 50%. In one village, it was found that for several years, no babies had survived the first 12 months. But in recent times, this situation has changed. Regular medical clinics are now conducted among the river villages with encouraging results. One of the most successful medical services for the Sepik people has been conducted from the Pathfinder, a combined floating home and mobile clinic operated by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The steady drone of Pathfinder's engine is a welcome sound along a 200-mile section of the winding Sepik River. Regular clinics are held at almost 60 villages, either on the main stream or along many of its tributaries. At time of filming, Lynn and Gordon Taylor, graduate nurses from Sydney Adventist Hospital, were the husband and wife team operating the Sepik Medical Service. Clinics are conducted on board Pathfinder, or at times on shore if this is more convenient. Local superstitions and inhibitions are overcome as mothers bring their babies for treatment. And little Christine is a goodwill ambassador among the village people. Up to 400 general outpatients are treated each month, but maternal and infant welfare clinics make up the major portion of the medical work along the river. More than 1,500 infants are enrolled for regular checking, weighing, and receiving of medication when needed. Family planning clinics are also conducted with a steady increase in enrollment. In the field of preventive medicine, Injections and vaccinations are given for whooping cough, diphtheria, tuberculosis, polio, and tetanus. Infant mortality, once as high as 50%, has dropped dramatically to less than 1%, a most gratifying reward for those involved in this service. This same improvement in community health is found in a widespread area from the steamy lowlands of this great island to the temperate mountain plateaus. A sister medical unit is the Sopas Hospital and Nurse Training Center in the Western Highlands. In a land of rugged terrain, the airplane has brought speedy transport to difficult areas and lifted human communication, education, and health care out of the Stone Age. Papua New Guinea is now a self-governing nation in a few short years, Port Moresby, seat of government, has taken on many aspects of a modern, westernized city. University education is available to young people whose parents grew up in illiteracy. Church schools from primary to tertiary level are an important adjunct to the government education service. 
In a land where women traditionally took second place, bright young girls are proving that they can acquire useful skills and take their rightful place in a modern society. These centers of learning seem far removed dreamtime villages of the jungle country. No one can prophesy when dramatic changes in lifestyle will come to the children of the Sepik wilderness. Like the whispering waters of the great river, the ebb and flow of outside influences touch but gently the lives of Sepik suburbia. In the meantime, quality of life within the framework of the tribal society is being surely improved. Through the services of the Pathfinder medical team, better health and a new hope is brought to the villages of the river people. We're about out of time for now. Thanks for watching. We look forward to having your company next time on South Pacific Classics. I'm Alan Lindsay. God bless.